your, your neuromuscular system should be the thing controlling and supporting your joints. The passive restraints of your joints, like the ligaments and stuff, that's to like, that's like your, that's the railing on the side of the freeway when you're going through the mountains. Uh, that's like, a good analogy. It's, it's not, you're not, you shouldn't be like driving your car into that. Your neuromuscular system, this is a great quote, actually. I just thought of this. <laughs> you're, I'm going to post this on Movement Fixes Instagram. That's good. Your, your neuromuscular system is like you driving the car. The road is your range of motion, and the, the passive constraints are the guardrail and the freaking side of the mountain. So, yes, if you drive into the guardrail, it is designed to not have you fall to your death. But that doesn't mean you're supposed to do that. Don't do that. Drive the car. <laughs> Learn how to drive the car. That's called training. Training is when you're learning how to drive the car so you don't crash into the rail. Welcome to the Movement Code Podcast, where we help you decode movement, health, and lifestyle so that you can expand and grow. Hey guys, my name is Antonio Gurley, your host for the Movement Code Podcast. I am a father, husband, business owner, rehab practitioner, and coach. Information overload has paralyzed many of us, and we are overwhelmed with good intentions and don't know what or who to trust. We aim to provide you clarity and confidence by bringing you expert advice for the everyday person. Thanks for spending some time with me today and enjoy the episode. What's happening, guys? This is Antonio, your host for the Movement Code Podcast. Excited for today's episode. Today, we are chatting with Ryan DeBell from Movement Fix. Uh, Ryan has been one of the uh, top influencers um, that has really inspired me and directed a lot of how I practice, how I look at movement, how I kind of just think about um, the critical aspects to health, wellness, and fitness. So I'm I'm very excited to have him on the on the episodes. We can we can just dive into some of the questions and the talk to- the topics that um, you know I've always wanted to ask him personally, and we just kind of flowed with this episode. Uh, we ended up talking for about an hour and a half, uh, even though he told me he had a hard hour cut line. So I really appreciate him taking the extra time. But because of that. This is going to be a two-part series. So this is going to be part one with our conversation. Next week will be part two. And as always, we try to leave you with the weekly challenge. Okay, The weekly challenge will be introduced and dropped on part two. So for this week, what I want you to encourage you to do is revisit one of the previous challenges that we have gone over and discussed and, uh, and or if there's something that you've been wanting to implement or some sort of reset or goal that you've had in mind, now's the perfect time for you to try to apply that, okay? Uh, once again, this is a two-part series, so make sure to hang on uh, for both of those so you can get all the information, and I'm very excited for you guys to enjoy this episode. Before we do that, uh, a couple asks real quick. If you have not already done so, please subscribe to the podcast so that you can get the feeds when they drop. We're going to be changing it from Fridays to Wednesdays. Hopefully, we'll be getting those every Wednesday um, as we move forward. Give us a review. If you're enjoying it, please give us a review and share with a friend. We'd love to hear from you guys. Love to hear what you think about the uh, about the podcast. And last but not least, subscribe to our YouTube channel. YouTube is the place where you're going to get the best educational content about movement, breaking down movement, talking about uh, the various topics that we go over. And I will also ask, go ahead and subscribe to Movement Fix as well. Uh, Ryan's got a ton of great content on his page uh, that I know you guys will find super beneficial. All right. On with it. Enjoy. All right, guys. So today on the episode, we have Ryan DeBell with The Movement Fix. Uh, I'm going to uh, have Ryan uh, introduce himself here in a moment and tell, where, tell, tell you guys where you can connect with him. But this is uh, when I first started the podcast, Ryan was one of the first people I reached out to to actually be on the podcast. It's just taken with COVID and all this other stuff a couple of weeks for us to finally make it happen. But I'm super excited to chat with Ryan today and uh, have you guys uh, hear what um, we have to talk about. So uh, Ryan, where can people learn more about you, connect with you, et cetera? Yeah, uh, the primary place is themovementfix.com. That's basically the home base of everything. Um, and 
I also have a podcast, Movement Fix Podcast, and I'm most active on the podcast and my YouTube channel and the website. So um, those would be the places to find the uh, the things that I've made. <clears throat> it's the primary primary location. So yeah, <laughs> cool. movementfix.com. Uh, awesome. And I'm just going to be jotting some, some stuff down here. So if you see me looking uh-huh. down, uh, checking in my question. So to start off, uh, and I think it might be interesting to see where you're going with this. And I know you've launched some, uh, body weight training programs out there. So for anyone also that is struggling to find some workouts or they're kind of been doing the same thing over the last couple months with COVID and you need some variety, mm-hmm. um, you launched a body weight program at the beginning of this whole COVID, uh, pandemic, didn't you? Yeah. So I was thinking when everything was starting to shut down, I was like, what's the most useful thing that I could make for people? And so I made this 30 day, I didn't think it was going to, I didn't think everything was going to be closed this long, but I made a 30 day at home movement and like strength program. I guess you could call it that, but all you need is a towel. So I figured no, you know, everybody probably has weights now. I bet a lot, (laughs) I bet a lot of people have purchased some basic equipment for at home workouts. And so, yeah, um, there is quite a bit of variety in the at home towel program that I made that uh, is free actually. Well, it's free, but you can donate money if you want. We, (laughs) we, we don't charge, but we'll take the money if you want to donate it. <laughs> well, it's surprisingly though, is people, I think a lot of people do have equipment now, but for instance, there's a company called Rep Fitness, which is here in Colorado. They have been, they have been backordered on literally almost everything for weeks, if not months now. And when they do get shipments in and they open up online ordering, it's basically you get like a number. And I had a client who was trying to get some equipment and he's like, dude, I jumped on right when it was like, I, it said I could. And he's like, I was 9,000 in line for ordering. Oh my gosh. So it's yeah, still just absolutely insane. And you're seeing, unfortunately, you know, supply and demand, you're seeing some price gouging on certain pieces of equipment. But that's why I think, utilizing body weight and if everybody has a towel like you said which is you know super beneficial and uh i should po- i should repost this too because there's there's a lot of resources out there at least videos on like um um uh like ross training system he's big on like making your own home equipment as well mm. like a suspension trainer when i first wanted to get into su- using a suspension trainer i didn't want to drop 200 dollars for a trx so i took some webbing or some rope put some PVC handles in it and just had my own TRX. So there's a lot of things that you can do without weights. And that's why I think it's so beneficial to have a towel program on hand as well. Yeah. Just to have options, right? I mean, how many times can you do burpees and lunges and pushups, you know? So what I did with that program was I tried to make it as like kind of weird as I could, like different, Right. I wanted to make it a different thing that if you're bored of your workouts, you could do that. And at least there's some variety. Like there's some there's some movements that probably you've never done before. So uh it's like variety is the spice of life, you know. Yeah. No, it's good. And I uh hopefully we get into some novelty here in a middle bit by talking about movement. But just curious, you know, obviously with COVID, what's your uh, we'll say sorry, um uh regardless or aside from COVID, what is, what are one of your favorite training movements or what do you kind of gravitate towards? So for instance, those that like you had indicated, they're like, well, shoot, I do CrossFit. What's a good thing I can do? Some, for whatever reason, people love burpees and they just do burpees all the time. That's not my favorite, but I'm curious, what are some of your favorite go-to uh, movements that you enjoy? At, uh, generally? Uh, well, I think the foundation of my training is running. I think running, you know, it's interesting, like, uh, you know, how do they do max heart rate tests? How do they do VO2 max tests? It's like with running and you know, why? Because you can get your heart rate super high. Like I think that the cardiovascular system and the locomotion system like, are really meant to go hand in hand. And we try to elevate our heart rate and do this like anaerobic activity without running, but running is the staple of it. In my opinion, that's how, that's how we get it the highest. So I'm a huge fan of running and, 
I've actually been quite limited. I can't even run outside anymore here. They actually locked it down. Oh, really? So yeah, I really like doing at home now. I like doing a lot of like stuff on the ground. So like different types of planks and push-ups and then like um, downward dog, but like variations of that. I don't know. It, I'm using this time being stuck inside to like really dial in my diet and um, work on just generally moving around. And then when things open back up, I'm going to ramp up my training, but I'm using it as sort of like a down meso cycle, I guess you could say of like recovery. I mean, if you've been training hard for 10 years, 20 years, even five years, when have you ever taken three months to really rest and eat healthy and de-stress and let your body sort of rejuvenate? So I'm approaching it that way, but I did just get these like plastic weights that I found at this store here. Nice. So it's like, it goes up to like eight kilos per hand. <laughs> There you go. But I'm, <laughs> I've accepted my fate that I'm going to wither away a little bit uh, yeah. until I can get access to heavier things. But no, uh, yeah, so running for sure, if possible, and then a lot of walking. I think that's also very underappreciated, the importance of walking a lot. Um, and then honestly, everything else, just whatever I can do right now to keep myself feeling like I'm staying physically active <laughs> i i think those are two big two big ones and um as i was mentioning kind of beforehand i had dan john on the podcast who i am i mean i'm i'm super biased and i just really just read i i really connect and resonate well with just the message that he sends and and uh i think you speak a lot of the same um philosophies if you will which is trying to simplify things and not overcomplicate to a certain degree and he's a big fan of walking like when you're talking about fat loss are you walking right that's one of the main things that help with fat loss and then inefficient exercise whatever that might be running is on the top of that category as well and just as you had mentioned right it it just jacks up your heart it could depending on what you're doing very easily essentially too, if you're trying to work on that uh, fat loss mentality. And it's interesting because we connected uh, over at Parker Vegas at the beginning of this year before actually everything was going crazy. I mean, we, we probably got COVID there. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, haven't been tested. I don't know, but I mean, it's very possible that we have it, isn't it? Like don't, a lot of people don't have symptoms. We were at a conference where people traveled from all around the world and gathered together. Yeah. So right before it happened, and we know that there were cases months before that. I don't know. It's it's interesting. So my mother in law um, got the antibody test, which uh, she tested negative for. Which we have kind of opinions on how uh, how accurate antibody the antibody tests are being provided. They were on a cruise in January with people from other countries all over. Two weeks after the cruise, a bunch of people that they knew got sick with something different kind of symptoms, but got hit hard. They help watch our kids. So we, you know, we have constant interactions. And this was way back in, you know, January and February before I even really knew of anything. About two weeks after she reported having this cold or whatever, I got hit with something I've never had. Not the typical symptoms, but I slept for two days straight. I was out. So I haven't gotten the antibody like test, but I had something that I have never had before. And it was weird. Yeah, I'm really, I'm very curious, to, as I'm sure you are, to get tested and see, you know, because it's, it's interesting, right? You hear people who are like, I have a friend that got tested and he tested positive and he said that he was barely sick for, for one day and that was it. So it's just, it's very strange. It's, it's very interesting how it hits people in a variety of different ways. Yeah, that's why, you know, you should never, like, your physical health is one of the greatest assets that you have. Like, I think that as a human being, you have several assets, right? Like one of them is your physical health. <clears throat> Another one is your mental abilities and like your capabilities to use knowledge. Obviously there's like, you know, financial assets, but like not investing into your own health, not exercising, making sure that you're eating well, sleeping. Hey, if something happens in the world and you know, you're susceptible because you weren't taking care of your health. It can, it's, it's, it's much more expensive at that time than it would have been had you just done the little things that are 
that compound over time to help you be healthier. Um, uh, so I mean, that's not necessarily just related to, <laughs> to COVID, but just generally speaking, right? If you have poor health, if you have, um, you know, comorbidities and things like that, then, you know, things like this are worse. If you're really healthy and you're robust, your body is more prepared to handle things. So, you know, that's one of many, many, many things that we can try to learn from, from what's going on. No, and I, th- I think that's, I think that's very valid because I think more than anything, this is just a big wake up call for, for everybody, right? It's, it's that we are, uh, we are human. I mean, we do catch viruses, bugs, colds, whatever it is. Uh, we are human. We do have the, um, we're not immortal. And for a lot of people, this scared the hell out of them in the sense that they're like, maybe I was not as healthy as I thought I was. Um, those that are a little bit more maybe concerned about the outcomes with a lot of this stuff. And I think that comes back to what we were saying before is the compounding things that you do consistently that would lead to a, a, a physically healthy body. For instance, daily walking. So we we were fortunate where we have we had a pretty extensive garage gym <laughs> before all of this happened, you know, uh, some barbells, mostly just kettlebells and stuff. But the one thing that that we do every single day is we go on at least a 45 minute walk. It's time with our family, time for me to connect with my wife, time for the kids to walk around. But almost every single day, six, six times out of the week, six days out of the week, we're going for a long walk. And I think people forget how beneficial something like that stacks up. Well, very consider, well. This. consider this. <clears throat> if you think about all the history of humanity, and if you think about what activity collectively burn, has burned the most calories in all humans? There's no way it's not walk like walking. I mean, yeah, and and I I mean movement wise. I don't mean like breathing and digestion. Like if there's one physical activity that has accounted for more calories burned in the history of all humans together, how could it? Like, it must be walking. <laughs> And so why would you not be doing the one thing that's like the biggest piece? I mean, maybe that's not totally accurate, but you get my point. Like it's such a, I mean, you obviously understand. It seems so insignificant, but. Well, I think it's funny too, and I think a lot of, I think part of the reason why people don't want to do it is it's not intense enough. It's balancing intensity versus goals and outcomes, right? You think the harder you go, you're potentially burning more calories and having more benefit, which could be true to some capacity, but there's a lot of just different elements to that, especially when you're blending in high intensity day in and day out with a lot of the same movements too. Yeah. It's either um, not, not understanding what your goals are with clarity or it's not, it's a lack of education about the frequency of doing really intense workouts and does that actually align with what you're trying to accomplish you know like you can't be stressed out all the time and working out really really hard all the time and expect your body to be in a in a in a really healthy state and like when i made that towel program it just a touch on that again, some of the thinking behind that, it was like, look, this is going to be a very stressful time mentally, psychologically, um, and, you know, probably in a lot of other ways, it's not the time to try to crush workouts. It's, it's time to take care of yourself. And then, you know, when other stressors go down, yeah, ramp up your workouts, but (laughs) it's not so black and white. as just like, I want to, you know, work out. So I have to work out as hard as I can. And that's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. It's more nuanced than that. The the human body can do many different things and, and it's, we're exposed to many different things and we're in an environment and those things have to be considered when deciding what programming is best to help you achieve the goal that you are trying to achieve. What, What was kind of funny is gyms have been starting to open up. Uh, here, here at least in Colorado, and you know it's a lot of social distancing, blocked off areas, and everything. Everyone's trying to do their part, which has been good, um, and not downplaying 
the effectiveness of what online classes and training and programs gyms have been able to put out for their members, but you're starting to see a lot of people post, I'm hitting PRs, like the programming's so good outside of the gym that I was hitting PRs when I got back or I'm maintaining this training. I'm like, hey, that's great, but could it be that you're actually recovered from not going to the gym, hitting it as hard as you were doing day in and day out before. And that's what actually allowed you to hit these PRs because you actually had a recovery cycle now. Yeah, exactly. Like you, you gave yourself a, a rest cycle for yeah. the first, for the first time <laughs> like Ever. you gave yourself, you gave yourself an off season. Yeah. And it's, there is uh it's funny, um, just naturally just between, I don't know, it's just work life and everything else. I worked out once last week, like worked out, I had one training day and it was just a lot of stuff going on. Like, like you had said, just stressful times, all this other stuff. And, but we did our walks and I felt, I didn't feel, I didn't feel off. I didn't feel depleted of anything. If anything, I felt like actually more energized, just actually listening to my body. I'm like, I do not want to do anything today. There was some, you know, like some stretchy mobility and just basic stuff, but it wasn't like an intentional train cycle just because I felt fried. Yeah, it's important to listen to that. And that's that's a hard thing to develop, interpreting what your body is, is telling you. Yeah. I think that um like imagine imagine somebody who had never learned how to write in their life. Okay. They never learned how to write English. But you did, and you have access to a keyboard. So think of the things that you can do and the depth that you can go in that area that somebody couldn't otherwise. The same thing is true with listening to your body. If you've never even tried, there is a world of information that you can gain if you listen that you just don't even know yet. Like probably in a way that is hard to even understand until you've really spent the time testing and being aware of what you're feeling and giving yourself time and experimentation to figure out, figure that out. No, that's good. This this came for for those that are listening that listen to also Joe Miller's podcast we had just a couple of weeks ago. She, we we got into this and and kind of the um, uh, tuning in with the parasympathetic response and whatnot. Of she used this mentality of my body thinks and feels, and it's just looking at that opportunity in whatever you're doing and taking kind of this head to toe audit also internally how does your gut feel and all of these different avenues to just become more in line with how you're actually feeling and what things are contrib- possibly contributing to those that you can that you have within your control cuz not everything is within our control right so we if we if we can definitely, take the, if we definitely can take, not yeah if we can take take a take advantage of the things that are within our control and get a little bit more maybe stability then you find that you're not drifting off as far away from it. Yeah. I mean, essentially the only thing that's under our control is our internal environment and our thoughts. Like everything else can be taken from us. I mean, you could be thrown in prison. Like you could have the military could take over and, and ration food. Like you can't even necessarily control what you eat. I mean, it's like not hard to actually think about how this could escalate to a point where like you get a ticket and you have to go exchange that for your food. I mean, imagine if the food, if the food, like the supply chains really got messed up, they're going to have to do that. So then you can't control what you're going to eat, but you can control your internal environment and you can control your thoughts. It's like, that's where you have to start. I mean, cause that's where the ultimate control comes mm. from. In my opinion, if you're not controlling, you first have to become aware of your thoughts and understand that, uh, your brain is your tool and you get to choose what happens inside of it. You don't need to let random thoughts dictate what you think. So first it's, di- it's, it's taking control and being aware of your thinking. And then once you have that, then you can basically, you know, try to find the other things that you can control. But I think it starts there. Um, can you imagine that if we had to get, we had to like exchange a a ticket for a meal and it was just like white potatoes or something. <laughs> Yeah, it's that's crazy, man. I mean, those are those are those are very valid points. Like we, so much of we think that's actually in our control really isn't. Just based on governing bodies, where you live. Yeah, look around. I mean, we're not even allowed to like 
at least where I am right now, I can't even go to my friend's house. The government is dictating who I can spend time with. I mean, who would have ever thought that would be the case? Mm -hmm. Nobody. I mean, so now we know that the governments are really in control and we're pawns and whatever they say, essentially. (laughs) Yeah. So what, you, what, what can we really control is our own thinking and our own internal environment. So when, fostering when, those. When, when did you, uh, when did you start kind of realizing that, that, that thought process of controlling your thoughts? Was there, was there kind of an event? Was it something that developed? Was it something that was uh, kind of encouraged or taught to you? I read this book for the first time like five years ago ago called think and grow rich which is like a, a very very like probably one of the most popular books ever besides like the bible um and i read that like five years ago for the first time it was my first exposure to to that and then um i didn't really understand it the book i, I probably read that book five times since then now I really understand it. And then it led me to studying the subconscious mind. And then that led me to studying uh, like Buddhism and uh, mysticism and some like Eastern religions where they really dive into, there's only two things. There's only two locations in the world. There's the outside and there's the inside. Like there's no, there's no, North, East, Southwest. Those are all things that we've created, right? Based on like the magnetic field of the earth. So those are all just made up essentially. But there is an, there is objectively, you can look and you can see that there's an outside world and then you have your inside world. And you, if you, if you realize that, you can take absolute control of your inside world. So it sort of came through through that path, I guess. <clears throat> but I started, yeah, I started reading a lot of books on the subconscious mind because Think and Grow Rich talks about using your mind essentially as your greatest tool. And so if you learn how to, if you learn how your conscious and subconscious minds essentially communicate with each other, then, and you're aware enough of that, then you can control it. So what that would look like you're having a negative thought about money, for example, you're like laying in bed at night and you're like, oh no, how am I going to pay my bills? The whole world is ending. Nobody's going to come in. All the businesses are going to get shut down. And it's like, why are you thinking that? You're not even choosing to think that. That's just a random electrical activity in your brain that you're not controlling because you didn't intend to control your thoughts. Because you could say to yourself, I'm not going to think that. And I'm done. But we don't, right? And so we simmer. We let that simmer and we don't address it. And it's in the back of our head and we're trying to hide from it. And we're trying to, it's like, if you just, if you just understand that, like, obviously there's real concerns in the world. Are you addressing them? Yes or no? If you are, then those thoughts are not helpful. So why let them happen in your brain? Well, well, there's no reason for them to happen in your brain unless you allow that. And if you're allowing that, it's because you're not aware that it's under your control, which it is. Who's, who, who, who's, who's controlling your thoughts but you? Nobody. You're just not doing the work to, to, to do that. It'd be like, who's controlling you going to the gym? Do you accidentally go to the gym and work out? No, you intentionally go to the gym and work out. Why, why, are, why are we not actively working on the way that we think and controlling our thoughts? It's so important. It's the beginning of everything. How can you go train well if you're anxious because you're not dealing with the way that you think? Like it's it's very very important. So, yeah, I've really I've really started studying that a lot more because I realized that you know, movement and exercise is super important, right? It is very important. Like we have we have our mind, we have our body, we have our spirituality, we know, obviously, there's different, you know, religious takes on that. But like, if, if you're not thinking clearly, and if you're not controlling your thoughts, how can you expect the other areas of your life to be good? It's like by accident, if you control the internal environment, you can basically operate in a way that allows you to have an, a better Um, external environment so then when you're you know 
So then, uh, yeah, I don't have enough. I'm just gonna. I'm gonna put a period right there. <laughs> Good. Good. No. No. That's. Um. And I'm sure. I mean, as you had said, that's definitely one of the most well-known books. I've been through it a number of different times, and mostly just because. And it's. I don't really know where it maybe developed for from me, but the whole idea of controlling your thoughts up until very similar, like a couple of years ago for me was just seems so far fetched. It was nothing that I've ever really come across before or anything else like that. It just, you know, maybe it's just part of the system kind of mentality of you do this, you do this, you do this. I even going through undergrad, which, which encourages critical thinking skills, but critical thinking skills in a very direct fashion towards a degree or towards a specific problem. And I was never really exposed to critical thinking skills from an internal standpoint of like, what are my own thoughts and how am I manifesting that myself? And it's been, it's been really challenging for me, especially bringing in other people into my life, such as my wife and my kids, because now I have, I feel like I have this responsibility, which I do have a responsibility to protect, provide for them and whatnot. But how, how that turns very materialistic, because now I'm in this external world, I need, sh- I need shelter, I need clothing, I need food, all of these things, which I technically do not have, right? They're not in my control, because things could change. And it's just very, it's, it's been like this very interesting um, journey for myself of, trying to control those thoughts, not spiraling, being able to provide for them in a positive manner and not being like fear avoidant of like, can I give them everything that they need? Yeah, it's interesting, right? I mean, there's so many <clears throat> financial concerns, right? I mean, like if everybody had like a million, like $10 million, right? Like a lot of anxiety would go away, <laughs> which shows us that most people's, a lot of people's anxiety comes from uncertainty in the future of uh, shelter, food, and clothing. And it's like, why, you know, why? And it's because it's because if, um, if you don't trust, if you don't have like hope or faith, then it's like you have this like part of you that can either be hopeful slash faith or fear. And so you have to have faith in something, right? And maybe that's in you now a religion. Maybe it's faith in yourself. Maybe it's faith that your future self will know how to solve the problems that you might encounter. And then it, like, if you don't see it that way, then if you have these spiraling negative thoughts, it's like you're trying to solve a problem that you can't actually do anything about in the moment. So then you're stressed out and you try go and try to work out and it's like, oh, my workout, oh, I didn't. Well, of course, you, you, have so many un- you have so many things about yourself that you haven't addressed to really be you know, functioning optimally. And then we just work out harder and harder to try to get a dopamine or some sort of like a reward so that we can avoid the anxiety that we're not dealing with in the other parts of our, ourselves. So these things are so interconnected that, you know, we have to look at them both in ourselves and in our clients or our patients that we work with. It's not just about the shoulder or the back. How do you even think about this whole situation that you're in? How do you even think about your body? Do you know what you value? Do you know what you care about, what your goals are? I mean, there's so many things that have to be aligned in order to achieve a state of health. And the, if, if your mind, your body, or your energy, or your spirit, if you do not have those things, um, if you're not addressing and working on those, on those, then you're not going to have an aligned alignment of the three. And then you have all sorts of things go awry. So, yeah, like. I think that's what a lot of people do though. I think they work out hard and intense because they get, you know, a rush of endorphins like post exercise endorphins. And they, a lot of times I think we can become addicted to exercise as a, as a mask for other things that we're not dealing with. So then you become addicted and then you're always trying to work out super hard and you need a bigger and bigger dose. So it needs to be harder and heavier and faster. And it's like, you go down this rabbit hole of how did I even get here? Now I have all these things in my life that I haven't addressed, but I'm, I can work out super fast. 
Yeah, it's interesting you messed up, uh, mentioned that because uh, uh, Stephen Pressfield's book War on Art that reminds me of that. Where basically, for those of for those of us that are either creators or you know he's using art as a as kind of a general term for um, creativity and creating uh, creating content, whatever that is in in a work environment, getting work done is we find escapes from those things that we're hitting resistance against, right? So if you're having resistance in relationships. I'm going to substitute that for working out. If you're having resistance at work, I'm going to substitute that for working out. The, the issue, the issue that is the resistance in front of you is the thing that needs to be dealt with. And the working out of the training super hard is the, the uh, escape. Well, we are as human beings, unless we're very conscious of what we're doing, uh, we're seeking pleasure and we're avoiding painful things, you know? So if it's painful for you to, in the short term, to address something that you're not dealing with, you're going to go for a short-term pleasure. But I think that's a long-term detriment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and like you had mentioned, if you're dealing with shoulder issue, back pain, whatever it is, it's, it's important that some of these things are being addressed. Like for instance, I, uh, just off the top of my head, this was a year ago. I had, I had a, a patient who came with, with back pain, which was, a recurrent episode from something she had years down the road. And I was just like, Hey, just kind of curious, like what's kind of going on in your life right now. And, uh, she had, I think two kids, I'm trying to remember if it was one or two recently divorced, had to get her own house and go back into the workforce. And she hadn't been in the workforce in like 10 or 15 years or something like that. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, damn, that's like some heavy stuff. Like, you know, we'll help with maybe muscle tightness and things where we can, but understand that you're in a very, very rough season of life. And there'll be, there'll be a growing period out of that, which will have some aches and pains. Yeah. I was, I was talking to this guy. I had this strange realization the other day. I was doing a podcast with this guy and we were talking about parasympathetic versus sympathetic nervous system. And, you know, I never really thought about it, but depending on which state you're in, you change where blood goes in your body. Like you're, and what does the blood, you know, do? It's supplying oxygen and nutrients. It's clearing waste products. If you're always in a sympathetic, stressed out state, like think about where the blood isn't going. (laughs) You're definitely not in repair mode. Yeah. So why would you expect, you know, your body to be in a state where healing is the priority it's not going to be that's why it's so important to like if you're if you are stressed you could be stressed out because something actually happens or you could be stressed out because you're telling yourself a story in your head about something both of those will create a sympathetic response which means you're going to change the hormonal balance of your body and where blood flow is going do you think being in a sympathetic state is a good way to, you know, repair your tissues? No. So that's why your thinking will greatly affect your physic your physical body. I mean, you see this very clearly in the placebo and nocebo effects. If somebody believes they're given a medication and it's going to work, it, you know, even though it's like not actually the medication, it for some people they get improvement, which shows you that the the thought in the mind manifests in a physical change it's like it, it's it, it's like inarguable it is completely real so to not address that especially in something like like okay if somebody fell off a bike and they hurt their wrist then obviously it's that right but yeah my back hurts i don't know why i'm super stressed out like this like this client you're describing yeah there's probably a lot of other things going on besides the mechanics of the lower back that are feeding into the pain and the, and the, and the suffering, you know, we don't want people to suffer. Yeah. I I think that's what's, I think that's what's, um, uh, you know, when we're during our intakes, one of the first things most clinicians ask, right. Was there trauma, right? Did something happen? And to be honest, at least in my practice, the majority of people don't come in with trauma. Yeah, maybe they like they were on a rower and they pulled on a row and they tweet their back. But like, unless you're in the emergency room or if you're like a physical therapist doing post-surgical cases, it's probably like I don't know, it's kind of tweaked. 
right? Yeah. So the conversation we had, and I always try to, you know, uh, try to throw some amusement in there where I can. I'm like, aside from getting in a car accident or getting kicked by a horse or something weird like that, there is something that created this weather faulty biomechanics. So then we, we screen that you're doing a movement assessment. You look for those things, or you have to get into that, uh, the, the, so, the, um, the biosocial, the biosocial aspect of that. You have to ask about those things and see how certain things might be developing. And it's, you know, it's, it's unfortunate and, you know, a little disappointing. Sometimes I don't get hung up on it. Like I used to when I was a new grad, but how certain industries and certain professions, right. It's, it's just very, it's just very vanilla. Oh, you have pain. It's because of this. We fix this. And we know manual therapy and time and dealing with those things helps suppress. That's you know there is there is validity to that. It helps bring us into somewhat of a parasympathetic state. But I you know we're we're just such big proponents of just having conversations with people to really understand who the person is and 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 what they're what they're trying to get out of it. Because most of us we're we're trying to avoid pain, but we always tell people. I'm like, if, if you're trying to avoid pain and you don't want your shoulder to hurt, you can go take some ibuprofen, right? But if you actually want to like try to figure out how to deal with what's going on and elevate yourself hopefully to another level, then we got to have those conversations. Yeah. I mean, you have to look at the bio of the biopsychosocial for sure, right? Which is essentially a math problem in a way right like if someone's working out and they get like a training related injury it's either that you your training volume and your recovery let's call that one piece you you don't you don't have your training volume and your recovery balanced in a way that will allow your tissues to adapt faster than you're stressing them so that's like the first part and the other part is like are you doing it in a weird way so it's like how are you doing it and then how much are you doing it for the bio barring some like you know they missed a snatch and they tore their labrum because their arm got twisted weird and Mm -hmm. they've been doing you know they've been snatching with poor uh form in their shoulder where they've been relying on the passive structures of their shoulder for their stability but um yeah and then you know for the social right now the social is huge like if you want to talk about understanding the biopsychosocial model, like think about how the social part has been affected for everybody. Everybody's social lives have been completely demolished. Yeah. There is no social life right now. And then, you know, the psycho, it's like, what do you believe is happening to you? Do you think that you're a victim? Do you think you have control over this? How do you interpret the pain? How do you inter- how are you projecting your pain into the future? Do you think it's going to be something that limits you for a long period of time? There's so much to get into. Um, and part of the, you know, part of the problem, I think, also, which requires careful analysis is knowing like which one of those things to really spend time on with each individual person. Like you don't want to go down the hole of social if it's a bo- if it's an actual just like you've been lifting with in a way that you're stressing your back really weird, like do that first. Right. So it's like figuring out which one of those holes to sort of dive down into with a person is you have to pay careful attention to to what's in front of you. Right. Which is why you need to understand that it's a a person that you're working with. And And people are not just robots that move a certain way. And there's some broken piece, you know, we have a nervous system and the nervous system has a lot of, strange characteristics like the nervous system is by far the strangest and least understood systems in the body dude yeah I, we i had a patient yesterday who was coming in with some patchy leg stuff and nothing was adding up and i was just like i have no idea and you know complications of postpartum had epidural c-sections maybe it was this maybe it was that and you know everyone wants to believe it was this i'm like that doesn't sound right but what i'm doing doesn't sound right i'm like let's just try this real quick and and, you know on that same note trauma epidural cesarean birth belly birth and then everything that comes with the post postpartum complications not only that difficulty nursing breasting latching working from home during a pandemic 
I'm just like, hey, like, let's just appreciate everyone's healthy and alive for right now. And I, I know you have pain down your leg and some other stuff, but like, let's take a breath and see what we can do. Because everything so far has been like, hey, if this isn't this and you need to go here, you need to see a neurologist, you might need surgery or something. And I'm just like, dang. Yeah, I mean, because that, that pain, <clears throat> if it's you know severe down the leg and it's debilitating, it can totally take over that person's internal environment. There's no, they don't have any control over their internal environment. Like if you're really sympathetic due to pain and these beliefs, social isolation, like that, you have to have a really solid grasp on controlling your internal environment to like handle that situation well. <laughs> Otherwise, it'll lead you to being you know, easily irritated and like probably not making good decisions. It might affect the way you're eating because you're not able to center yourself and breathe and be grateful for the things that you do have. Right. I mean, that's a real challenge. And I think it's important too, like, like a lot of people talk about this too, surrounding yourself with obviously whatever you want to call it, positive people, people that are trying to help support you and lift you up. And, you know, in that example, unfortunately some of the medical providers in certain situations are just like yeah we don't know what's wrong you're just going to have to live with it or it's just going to take time and you know if that's something you believe i think it just needs to be articulated well it's just like hey we're going to work through it with you so many people are dealing with chronic pain aside from covid or not and they've just been told eh, you know this is you're broken this is the way it is find ways to live with it don't do this don't do that yeah, because it's hard to solve those. It's actually, it's actually really, it can be really challenging to solve people's, to help them solve. I should word that carefully, right? Because I don't solve anybody's problem. I show people how to solve their problems. That's it. Because nobody can do it but you. Mm-hmm. Nobody can force you to eat a certain way. Nobody can force you to go to bed at a certain time. Nobody can force you to change your form. Nobody can force you to do workouts in a certain way. But all that we can do is try to educate people on the best practices of the way the body, uh, mind, and spirit work. And when it comes to certain mechanical things like certain shoulder pain, back pain, it is not a fast or easy process because sometimes people do things with their body and they lift weights in a certain way or they lift in a certain way that puts their back or their shoulder in a position where it's like you just can't load it like that at the volume that you're doing because you're not using like your your neuromuscular system should be the thing controlling and supporting your joints the passive restraints of your joints like the ligaments and stuff, right? That's to like, that's like your, that's the railing on the side of the freeway when you're going through the mountains. Uh, That's a good analogy. It's it's not, you're not, you shouldn't be like driving your car into that. Your neuromuscular system, this is a great quote, actually. I just thought of this. (laughs) I'm going to post this on Movement Fixes Instagram. That's good. Your, Your neuromuscular system is like you driving the car, the road is your range of motion and the, the passive constraints are the guardrail and the freaking side of the mountain. So yes, if you drive into the guardrail, it is designed to not have you fall to your death, but that doesn't mean you're supposed to do that. Don't do that. Drive the car, <laughs> learn how to drive the car. That's called training. Training is when you're learning how to drive the car so you don't crash into the rail. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in for part one of this series with our conversation with Ryan DeBell. Part two is going to be dropping next week. As indicated in the pre-roll, we we do not have a specific week challenge for you this week, so I want to encourage you, retract some of the other challenges that we provided out in the following episodes and or if you have something that you've been wanting to implement or some sort of goal that's been on your mind, now is the perfect time for you to do a little seven-day challenge for yourself, Okay. 
Next week, we'll give you the challenge. We'll share with you the challenge that Ryan has encouraged all of us to do. So be sure to tune in next week for the second half of this conversation where we dive in even more to uh, certain movements, uh, sorry, certain movements such as, such as the squats. And you guys know I love talking about the squats. We get into that. And you guys, I know you guys are going to find that very beneficial. So we'll see you next week. Take care. Move well.